The Renaissance masterpieces of painting are amazing, some soft as if divine light and at the same time so realistic as if some of the figures are alive. But how were they made exactly? What kind of techniques were used? What kind of materials? The official answer for this is using a technique that is now forgotten and lost. We cannot replicate these paintings anymore. We still have very talented artists who can make something that looks very, very similar, but yet the actual way of applying the paint on the canvas, that cannot be replicated, not even close. So we know from other examples with the mainstream history that when they don't want the public to know something, they say it's a mystery and then they hide as much details about it as possible so that people will not find out the truth or even part of it. So let's see what the art historians know and how much are they telling to the public. Since no brush strikes are visible on the works of the masters of the era of, let's say, Leonardo da Vinci, although we are not even sure if he really made the paintings which are attributed to him, but let's assume that's true, we'll use him as a symbol of the era. So the art historians of the recent centuries, of course, they were wondering how did he paint exactly if we can't see any traces of brush being used. But they had to live with this mystery for them because, of course, there is no way to tear even a minute piece from any of Leonardo's paintings for the purpose of testing. And finally, some technology emerged which allows to measure the layers of paint, varnish and so on without damaging the masterpieces. It turned out that the paint was applied in numerous layers, let's say some 20 of them, and each of them had a thickness which reached down to 2 to 5 microns. Now, that's not just thin, that is very thin. Such a layer would be 50 times thinner than a hair, a human hair. And here, as usual with the, all the mainstream history, and apparently as we are going to see now with the history of art, start the discrepancies. The stories that they are telling us don't match with each other. These are the kind of pigments they used. At least according to what the art historians are telling us. This is in Rembrandt's house in Amsterdam. We are led to believe that Leonardo used exactly these very same standard pigments. Ground by hand, of course, at least according to the mainstream story. But how could they have been ground by hand 
if the finest powder that the human eye can discriminate is 70 microns big. There's a vast gap between 2 and 70, and that's the size of just one particle. As you know, artist paints are a very sticky substance. They do form some sort of volume, because even these practically invisible particles stick to each other. They don't just spread out over each other evenly and orderly, one particle neatly stacked next to the other, if you apply them with a brush on a canvas. So in other words, even if you magically obtain such a fine powder, as fine as each and every ground particle being the size of two microns, still you don't have a method of application which will guarantee you that the result layer will be only two microns thick. For example, in modern times, artists no longer labor at home grinding different minerals and other substances, they buy them from the shop. They are manufactured with highly specialized equipment, of course. They are extremely fine. And how fine? It depends on the color, of course, the size of the pigment particles in modern paints varies from 15 to 55 microns which of course does not guarantee you that you can make even a layer which is 15 or 55 microns thick because the art brushes that modern artists use are not magical devices that can order the particles to stand still like soldiers next to each other and not to overlap Moreover, these uh, particles will have to stand still in orderly rows to ensure coverage. Otherwise, the thing wouldn't get even colored after all. And yet another comparison in terms of how big microns are. Sprayed paint. The paint on your car is some 50 to 100 microns thick. So, in relation to these findings, a question was asked to high-level art historians, like those that are experts at the top-level auctions. And the question is, then what about forgeries? We hear about forgeries, how are they made? And the reply was that forgeries are made by taking a painting from that period but um, accredited or belonging to non-famous artist and making it look like it belongs to a famous one, let's say Leonardo da Vinci, by forging the name or making some other false clues to get high price for it. 
Otherwise, to start making forgery from scratch simply doesn't work. It may look exactly like an old painting, you may even make it artificially aged and cracked. But when the auction experts see it through magnifying glass, it becomes clear very quickly. The layer of paint is too thick for this to be an original Renaissance piece. You may smear the paint all you wish. You can wipe it out even with a cloth after every stroke of the brush. And still you will be miles far away from the technique of the old masters. Let's see what else we can find about the technique used by these Renaissance masters. The sfumato technique, it seems, that much is accepted to be known by art historians. So what we have here? Colors or tones are blended in such a subtle manner that they melt into one another without visible transitions, lines or edges. I mean, to paint using brush and not to have any lines or edges. Okay, if we stretch our imagination, then we could think of some sort of smearing and blending, but then it says there are no visible transitions as well. That's complex. So if we don't have even transitions, then how do we get different colors on the painting? So it says, typically involving the use of numerous translucent glazes to create a gradual tonal spectrum from dark to light. That seems to correspond the observations by the latest scans which measure the thickness of the layers, because indeed up to 20 layers of various colors were used, like smoky layers, nobody understands where do they start and end, and the result are paintings with like amazing divine light, and very realistic often. And the thickness of these individual layers of translucent glaze that they are talking about, they could be down to 2 microns thick and it would be like 20 of them stack on the top of one another. Actually this full situation of numerous layers which uh, without transitions and very thin does resemble something from our modern world, namely the printing techniques we use. So this fumato seems to resemble printing much more than painting, or at least the painting we do and understand nowadays. Because in printing we have this same principle, you know, three layers of the three basic colors precisely positioned on the top of each other, and that's how we get the colorful prints nowadays. Some printing techniques would use up to five layers, or even six, but still, we are nowhere close to 20. So again, 
printing is the closest to the technique used, but is definitely not the same. And it's not just the number of layers. Let's look into the printing ink that we have, the most modern technology. Now, that is significantly finer than the paint used by modern artists. Certain colors of printing ink barely even reach this fineness of two microns that was used in Leonardo's paintings. But again, these are not all colors, only some of them. So we're only getting close, we're not there yet. To be able to really paint or print Leonardo's paintings. In addition, superfine modern inks are not even a result anymore of very finely ground pigments. Instead of that, they use high-tech solutions, like trying to grow crystals and then harvesting them while they're fresh, young, and soft, so to say. In the end, it doesn't boil down to grinding the stone or some other easy-to-obtain substance very finely. It seems that the Renaissance masters, whose paintings we can't possibly recognize, The Renaissance masterpieces of painting are amazing, some soft as if divine light and at the same time so realistic as if some of the figures are alive. How were they made exactly? What kind of techniques were used? What kind of materials? The official answer for this is using a technique that is now forgotten and lost. We cannot replicate these paintings anymore. We still have very talented artists who can make something that looks very, very similar, but yet the actual way of applying the paint on the canvas, that cannot be replicated, not even close. So we know from other examples with the mainstream history that when they don't want the public to know something, they say it's a mystery, and then they hide as much details about it as possible, so that people will not find out the truth or even part of it. So let's see what the art historians know, and how much are they telling to the public. Since no brush strikes are visible on the works of the masters of the era of, let's say, Leonardo da Vinci, although we are not even sure if he really the paintings which are attributed to him.
So, this interesting piece of information about the thickness of the layers of the paint of Leonardo da Vinci's work was not hidden from the public. It can be found in a large number of scientific publications. And, as expected, people simply didn't understand what it meant. Their attention was further diverted by milder stuff, you might say, about the paintings, which doesn't really contradict the official paradigm about the history that they have already successfully implemented. In this society, most people believe that in the Middle Ages, people were more backwards than us. So, about this milder stuff, it's all right. They even made major TV channel documentaries and broadcast them. And the best example is David Hockney, who even published the book Secret Knowledge. He claims that from the year 1420 onwards, artists use mirrors, lenses, and camera obscura, which is a device which creates shadow images through a pinhole or a small lens. Those images would then be projected to a canvas, and then the artist would outline it with paint on the canvas. It could be. Of course, why not? Artists have been using all kinds of tricks and devices, but one of the experiments done along these lines may give us a clue about the technique that we are looking for. So they made a copy, actual physical copy of the chandelier shown on this painting. And uh, they positioned the lightning in such a way that it would look exactly as it does on the old masterpiece. It turned out that the glittering parts and the shades were extremely accurately painted. But they were like frozen in a moment, as if photographed. But on the other side, they are telling us that this light was achieved by putting numerous layers, and of course you have to wait a long time for them to dry to put the next one. So the question is, how would the artist remember the exact spots of light and shadow with absolute precision? It's impossible to uh, have the opportunity to look at it for hours because then the shadows change. The, the places of uh, shadow and light, they change very quickly, within minutes actually. While all this process of applying 20 layers and waiting them to dry, that takes years actually. And this is just about uh, one single chandelier, which is not even the main focus of the painting, it's actually a detail. What about the uh, clothing of the rich people who presumably posed for this portrait? Did they also stand like punished for years? Or was the play of shadow and light on their elaborate clothing also caught in a moment? and then transferred to the canvas in a moment? I mean, this is really lots of work. Look at the velvety feel of the cloth. Amongst thousands of other amazing details in just a small fraction of one painting. Or are we even really talking about the paintings in the sense we put in this word? I don't know. On the other hand, sometimes on the canvases below the paint painting, there are sketches made with other medium. So, on the other hand, there are clues suggesting that uh, it was painted in, in general, more or less the way we understand, you know, first you make a sketch and then you cover with some sort of paint. So, the two suspicious things are in the extreme fineness of the old paints and the fact that they could capture the image 
with all its details in the blink of an eye. There is some imagery suggesting that they might have used some sort of Tesla-style electricity in the Middle Ages. But as far as, like, really modern digital printers, I don't think so. Probably it was some sort of technique or technology which is totally beyond us. Something like the Meltalits. For those who have been following my work, for a long time I was pondering how on earth half of the wall looks absolutely natural, one can see proofs of it, and the other half looks man-made. How is that possible? And because with all sincerity I asked the universe, the angels, for explanation, it took time, but eventually I did find out how it was made. It was grown. So, in this video I discussed in detail the size of the particles of which the, the paint consists. Just because modern men will find it easier to relate to the topic if I approach it from such a perspective, in reality, even the very assumption that the paint used by Leonardo and the other Renaissance masters had to resemble ours but si simply be finer, that's an assumption only because modern equipment can easily measure the size in microns of modern paints, all kinds of paints even the relatively fine paints like the printing ink. Also, modern machines were able to measure the thickness of the individual layers of which Leonardo's paintings consist, but when they attempted to measure the size of the particles of the paint which he used, the result was that we don't even have an equipment that can measure them at all. So the Middle Ages, they were not that far away back in time. Maybe we have some sort of writing left where people explain how on earth were they painting. Yes, we have plenty of medieval literature discussing how to make things, but we just ignore it because it doesn't fit in our limited uh, understanding of uh, just grinding things into finer and finer powder. We don't read about a struggle of how to perfect the grinders in the Middle Ages. But we read a lot about transforming substances using metaphysical ways, like, for example, alchemy. That's exactly what it deals with, transforming substances in a way we absolutely cannot comprehend with the modern people. And because having limited paradigm goes hand in hand with being arrogant, we are also sure that since we can't comprehend it, they could not have comprehended it as well, the people of Middle Ages. But yet exactly, this Leonardo da Vinci, who is allegedly to be blamed for all the paintings that we can't replicate, he doesn't seem to be interested in digital grinders, but in alchemy. Or maybe something else that we find in the old books can also give us some clue to understand the overall situation. It is said that in the old times there were specially trained people who would twist the necks of the child's slaves, and it would be done in a peculiar way, so that when they grew up they would remain retarded. 
their nervous system would be damaged in such a particular way that they will develop physically and they will be able to work, but they won't be able to think much. That's what we find in the old books. Now, let's see what we can find in the modern books. There is more or less a standard birth protocol, enforced, of course, by the government and not by scientists, which has to be followed in the hospitals. This protocol often involves the twisting of the neck of the newborn. So all this twisting and pulling can very easily lead to traumas, and it does lead to such. They have been well studied and published by doctors who still feel pangs of conscience. A great number of children receive these type of birth traumas and is kind of normal that when they grow up, they will read about metaphysical transformations of matter, but they will simply not understand anything. Or if they do, and decide to test out how it works, it will simply not work for them. Although our psyche is not limited to the physicality of the nervous system, it is definitely plugged into that system, hence the full being, which consists of the body and more, will not function, because some of the parts are damaged. Of course, this is just one of the factors, a minor one, but it confirms the same pattern. Our ignorance, and often that results in misery, is self-inflicted, and we don't know how such paintings could have been made because we're not brave enough to see the truth. We don't want to know the full, big picture about the Middle Ages. The painting or printing techniques are just a very small part of it. For example, we have medieval maps showing the situation with the continents on Earth as we think it was millions of years ago. So we think this was discovered in very recent times. Also, we have a medieval map showing Antarctica without ice and showing its mountain ranges very realistically. Again, that seems like a total mystery for many, but actually the people knew a lot during the Middle Ages. There wasn't a problem for at least some of them to make such a map. And it's even possible that they made the map of what they saw. Possibly Antarctica was free of ice just a couple of hundred years ago and not thousands of years ago, as again we are being assured. Why? Because areas near to the North Pole became covered with glaciers relatively recently and more precisely maybe some 200 years ago. So if the North Pole was much warmer, then maybe the South Pole was warmer as well. Also, the people were quite different in those times. It seems most of them were quite shorter than us, visibly shorter. As it becomes clear when we see beds, paraphernalia, knight's armor and things like this that are left from those times. And at the same time, there were other visibly bigger people, two meters tall and even more. Also from the depictions and the narrations from that time, it seems um, what we call dinosaurs or dragons still were not completely extinct during the Middle Ages. So it was pretty interesting. Lots of diversity in the Middle Ages, also people with elongated skulls. We find uh, their remains and also stories about them, that somehow they are pure and... Uh, Always strange types of people when they appear, they always end up in some sort of uh, leaders, governors, advisors, this type. So it seems that genetic engineering was um, 
very actively used to influence the human society at that time. There were healthy big populations, entire tribes of Bigfoots living in Asia. Openly the people knew where their settlements, probably all over the, uh, the other continents was the same situation. But at least in Siberia we have some records left that they were not so much in hiding as now. Sometimes the people used to capture them and use them for heavy work, unfortunately. Dwarves also, they were openly in contact with people. They were trading with people. They would exchange their metal handmade items for various man-made items. So I hope you have enjoyed this video, which is uh, based mostly on the brilliant research of Alexei Artemyev. The images of the paintings that I've used in the video are not necessarily from the era that I've been talking about. Actually, there is no list of uh, paintings which have been definitely made using this uh, amazing technique of very, very thin layers. And that's why I simply used paintings of old masters without filtering them by time when they were painted. Which, by the way, cannot be known for sure anyway. Yeah.